the leaky ship, the leaky ship, the leaky ship, the leaky ship. The leaky the leaky ship. ship. The leaky well, the artists articulate, the, the artists are the people who first articulate the unknown. And so the role of artists in a healthy culture is to bring to public awareness elements of being that have not yet entered the, the collective consciousness. So you can imagine, imagine that we're all living on an island and many of us are in the center of the island, far enough away so maybe we can't even see the shoreline and we can't see the ocean. That's, that's where our borders end, but we're more distant from The artists are right on the edge and they're... They're, 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 they're expanding the landscape. They're, they're, they're moving the culture forward. They're moving the culture forward into the unknown, and they do that by translating what is as of yet unimaginable, but sensed into what is at least imaginable and representing not represented in off image and, and drama and literature. They that's the that's the which the right of which full formulation and articulated the philosophy of thought, and that's what artists do. They problem solve, problem integrators, and problem solve. That's what true artists do, and they're always trying to solve problems. Like if you, there's a great documentary that was made about the cast. A great documentary that was painting the cast. Unfortunately, I can't remember the name, but I think it was made in 1957. It's available on YouTube. It's available on YouTube. Picasso is filmed making a painting on a, on, a, on a window so that you can see exactly what it's doing. And you can watch him work with ideas. He, he paints something in and then he erases it. You know, he, he paints over it, then he paints again and he paints over it. He moves the figures around on the canvas. It's a, it's a window paint, as I said. And you can see him working out visual, you can see him working out problems and solutions to problems, problems using, using his visual using imagination. His imagination. And the, the artistic product, the painting, is, is the consequence of that rather than the aim of it. The aim is to formulate the problems and to work out the solutions and the artistic uh, product, the painting, is, is the byproduct of that, not the aim. And so artists move us forward into the unknown and you can see that if the project is what I said it was, it's what I said it was, it's what I said it was, in the sets of lectures before, trying to uh, create a human life that's free and so on, it becomes crucially important if the culture itself is beginning to, as it were, destroy, deconstruct, or disrupt the very conditions for being human at all. Because it becomes pointless to talk about free humans in the absence of humans. The artists are unbelievably productive economically. But it's very, very hard for them to monetize their productivity. So even though what they produce can be of incalculable value, um, it's very difficult for them to get any of the economic value that they're produced actually directed towards them. It's a major problem in, in it's a major problem with trade openness as a mode of being in the world. Because it becomes pointless to talk about free humans thoroughly commodified. In the of humans. The role of that culture is what might be characterized and has been characterized by the Frankfurt School as psychoanalysis in reverse. Namely, that the parts of us that are reflected, self-consciously creating, become unconscious. Just the psychoanalysis in reverse gear. That the, the moments of lucidity and clarity we thought we had about ourselves are now to be filled in with stories that we pick up largely from the map culture. Uh, a therapy now belongs, for me at least, to that terrain. And I have in mind all the various programs, projects, self-help books, 12-step plans, 10-step plans, fad diets, happy books, how to find your true self books, and so on. And so on. I mean, with young people, you want to say, look, there's not much to you. You're only 20 and you're kind of useless. But that's because you're only 20, you know. That doesn't mean you're not full of potential. That potential needs to manifest itself so that you can turn into something that's that's of, of like of, of world-beating significance. But in order to tell a young person that credibly, you have to say, look, there are true qualitative distinctions between things, and you're just getting started. There are heights that you can ascend to that are genuinely high, which also means they're above where you are now. But that gives your life, the fact that there are those things to pursue, gives your life deep meaning and significance and gives your struggle nobility and validity. 
and the postmodernists, Neil Marxists, as far as I'm concerned, are absolute enemies of qualitative distinctions, and so what they do is destroy everyone's ambition. No one, no one, Derrida, anyone else believes that every view is as good as every other What the hell are we going to do? That's only a view we discuss in freshman philosophy class in order to quickly refute it. What the hell are we going to do? No one believes it. What are going to do? There are no defenders. What are we going to do? Since this tape will be going out, if you run into one, it will be interesting. But we will likely find that person in one of the institutions that we to rather than in some seminar. Kind of. That's where we find anybody believes it. There's a moment when a guy named the Yellow Man is shot in an apartment, and then Jeffrey, uh, the main character, runs to the apartment. The guy's dead, he's just standing there. There's no explanation. He's just standing there. And it is, it's almost classically French, Franco, ballistically surreal. Um, and yet it seemed absolutely true and absolutely appropriate. And there was this, I know I'm taking a lot of time to answer your question, there was this way in which I all of a sudden realized that the point of being postmodern or being avant garde or whatever wasn't to follow a certain kind of tradition, that all that stuff is BS and posed by critics and peer followers afterwards that what the really great artists do. And it sounds very really trite to say that a well, what the really great artists do is they're entirely themselves. They're entirely themselves. They've got their own vision, their own way of fracturing reality. And then if it's authentic and true, you will feel it in your nerves. And this is what Blue Velvet did for me. I'm not suggesting it would do it for any other viewer. But I all of a sudden, Lynch very much helped snap me out of a kind of adolescent delusion that I was in about what sort of avant garde art could be. Uh, okay, so now we come to the plane. We had our point, we have our line, now we have a plane. According to the same process by Alpha Bung, by this lifting into and negation of negation, the truth of the line is the plane. So, of course, here now we have our line, but our line isn't just a line, it's a series of points that also extend out to infinity. So, if you turn it, you have a plane, and here he's actually quoting uh, uh, Hegel. The line consequently passes into the plane, which, on the one hand, is a determinateness opposed to line and point, and so surface simply is such is to say, if you have a plane, it just takes up everything, so there is no line or point within it whatsoever. But on the other hand, it is the sublated negation of space. It is thus restoration of the spatial totality, which now contains the negative moment within itself. So, so while I'm not expecting that anyone actually is, is there to a moment of clarity, I will tell you uh, that this, in fact, is the moment where the hierarchical distinction between presence and absence, between the differentiated and indifferentiated, starts to break down. The one is starting to be the other. And now, because you're all looking at me perplexed, as though I've just been, I don't know, speaking some incomprehensible uh, bar bar language, which perhaps I have, let's, let's see if we can do this in a, a non-linguistic way. Well, it's a little linguistic. Uh, here, so, so let me start with our point. And so we have, oh, our point is moving away on me. Our point became a line. Utopian speculation aims at a radical transformation. Utopian speculation aims in that respect. It remains the sibling uh, of revolutionary thought that today occupies the place of a revolutionary politics, which has not yet fully re-emerged from the transformations of globalization and post-modernity of finance capital on a world scale. Utopian thinking demands a revision of Gramsci's great slogan. It might run like this: cynicism of the intellect. Utopianism of the will. Derrida himself later said, no, in fact, what I'm saying is, there's nothing outside the text, it's all context. There's no inside or outside of the text. He gets so far inside the text that he gets himself way outside. Except history in what is called his materiality. Yeah, yeah, in other words, along with all of its contingencies, its moment, 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 walk, 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 the strange and bizarre, bizarre, bizarre things, things that have happened. Happen. I mean, I mean, I mean even, even Marx does this when he writes, he writes the, the history of the rise of capitalism. capitalism. It, just it just turns out to be fortuitous that gold is found in the new world, which then can be sent back to Europe to build merchant capital. Well, if over here they had found cow chips, only buffalo chips, then that contingency would have affected this. And that seems to me to just be 
not something that could have been predicted by a rational narrative. They happen to find God. It's second rate, second rate at least. It's terror too because people are afraid of beauty. But the idea that art is. The conservatives really have a problem with this in particular because conservatives tend not to be that creative. And it's a mystery, mystery by temperament. It, it's a mystery to me because they should be concerned with economic development. And beauty is so unbelievably crucial to economic development. It just yells out at you, you know? So, so. Anyway, so that's what artists are doing. And so one of the things I would say is buy a damn piece of art, you know? Find one that really speaks to you and, and buy a piece of art because you invite that into your life. And it's, it's a look out if you do it, if it's a real piece of art, because you'll also get a, you know, a little introduction to the artist and then that'll seep into your life. And that'll change things like mad. But it's really, it's unbelievably worth it because it, it opens your eyes to the domain of the transcendent. That's the right way of thinking about it. A real piece of art is a window into the transcendent. That's what it is. And you need that in your life because you're finite and limited and bounded right by your ignorance and your lack of knowing. And unless you can make a connection to the transcendent, then you don't have the strength to prevail. And that's part of the covenant. That's part of the covenant of an odd. 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 Being is whatever is uncovered by the empirical science, being the sciences, being is this, uh, being is non-existent, whatever we've tried to fill in the blank with, we have not yet reached closure. That's why I said that philosophy is a funny endeavor, it has a 2,500 year history of failure and yet it continues. So obviously it's not quite in the spirit of capitalism to engage in this enterprise. It's a long time to run a failing business. This won't, this won't be, this blank can't be filled in. Being is, can't be filled in. The blank won't be filled, can't be filled in. Why not? I mean, we want an argument. We don't want this. I mean, the first thing is that we've noticed that no one's ever successfully filled it in. That's the first thing we notice. That, you know, the history of philosophy has not yet presented us with final wisdom, total coverage, and ultimate truth. We know that, so that's step one, is to know that. See, philosophy is not like building a house where you start with a firm foundation and build it up and you're finished and you walk off and that's philosophy. Philosophy under the heading of deconstruction is housework, which means every day the floor is to be swept again. The dishes have to be done again. And I'll be damned, the next day it's just like that again. And it's just like that again. And it's just like that again. So deconstruction, if I wanted to compare it as a practice to some other practice, it would be housework. It doesn't get finished. And the equality of men and women becomes a universal social reality so inevitable uh, that it seems uh, to be a mere fact of nature rather than a lofty ideal of some kind. The gradual transformation of subjectivities as they adapt or are reprogrammed to new infrastructural realities is called cultural revolution. If we don't have enough hierarchies of confidence for everyone, then, you know, it's up to the creative people to produce some new ones.